If you'll go ahead and turn to John chapter 4, we'll do a very brief um, review of where we are in John. Uh, and I will ask the question, I'll continue to ask the question, why are we even studying this? And what was the purpose of the book of John, I guess, would be a better, better question. So that you may believe. And he gives that at the very end. Um, all these things have been written so that you may believe. And so we're starting to see some... I need to turn this on. So we're starting to see some, um, some miracles that Jesus has performed, and not everybody is very receptive to Jesus, and that's going to become very uh, clear here in John chapter 5, that there are some major issues with what Jesus is doing as far as these uh, miracles and these signs. Um, but let's back up to John chapter 4. Um, and we see that um, it starts out with uh, the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. Although Jesus himself was not baptizing, it was his disciples that were baptizing. And there comes some discussion uh, about that. However, what we see in verse 7 starts this whole story about the, uh, about the Samaritan woman or the woman at the well. And um, this very com this conversation about uh, who Jesus is, who she is, and her reaction to that. And it says that, you know, she goes back into the town and she tells them, I want you to come talk to this guy because he what? Told me everything. Told me all about myself. And uh, this conversation obviously changes uh, the course of her life. And um, we did talk about also that Jesus really doesn't pull um, any punches here. He tells her a couple of things. First of all, you're in sin because you're, you're, the man you're with isn't your husband. And uh, he also uh, mentions uh, something else, and that is what? That she's doing wrong. Her religion, when she brings it up, he points out. You know, it's the Jews are right, the Samaritans are wrong. Right. Her, her religion or her way of worship towards God is incorrect. The, you know, the Jews worship what we know. You guys worship what you don't know. And then he says, but there's going to come a time that it's neither here nor there, but it takes a certain type of person that God is seeking. Um, and then after that, um, we see that his um, disciples come, and they are amazed that he'd been speaking uh, to this woman, nobody said anything to him, however, um, but she brings some from the city to him, and they um, listen to what he has to say, and their statement um, in verse 41, many more believed of his word, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. So their understanding of the Christ and the Messiah is actually correct, and that is that he is the Savior of the world. And um, we also see after two days he went forth into Galilee, so he stays there a couple of days, and then he finally uh, makes it back into Galilee. Um, and then we see this uh, story of um, this official who has a sick child, and the official comes up and says, Lord, will you heal my child? And um, it says in verse 48, So Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Now, notice the contrast between the Samaritans and they took, uh, did they need all these signs and wonders? No, as a matter of fact, they said it's not because of what you said, but it's because of what he says that we believe. And so they're taking him at his word, whereas we see the Jews are actually needing signs and wonders. And then we see that he does heal the, heal the child, and the royal official said to him, um, Sir, come down for my child dies. And Jesus says, Go, your son lives. And then he checks, uh, as he was going down, the slaves met him, saying that his son was living. And then he uh, inquires, or he asks them about the hour when he began to get better. Uh, then they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And so then he knew in that hour is whenever Jesus said that he had been healed. And then at that point, um, it says in verse 54, uh, or verse uh, 53, he himself believed in his whole household. Um, so he didn't need to see that sign and that wonder to believe that Jesus was the Christ. And that's just 
as Jesus said would happen. Um, and this is again the second sign that happens around um, that, that place. All right, after these things, there's a feast of the Jews, and Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. Um, and I'm in chapter 5, and we'll start in verse 1, and then in verse 2, it says, Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. All right, so what is going on here? If you've read John chapter 5, can you kind of tell me kind of the setting of what, what this is? The people were laying out the, the, those that are sick or afflicted are laying out waiting to be dipped into the pool. Yeah. Um, it seems to be that an angel of the Lord comes down at a certain time or season or whatever and then disturbs the water and the first person that gets into the water is healed. Um, and so we see that's kind of the setting that you're uh, at. And if you look up that uh, term sheep goat or sheep gate, I'm sorry, sheep gate, um, that is actually mentioned a couple of times in the in the Old Testament um, about when they were putting the walls up, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But it, it mentions that, and uh, I won't take time to read those. But we do see that at at, certain, at some point in time, this angel comes and disturbs the water, and then we see in verse five, a man was there who had been ill for thirty-eight years, and Jesus kind of sees him laying there. And Jesus asked a question. What is he asking? Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Now, we may think that sounds almost like a silly question to ask someone who's kind of laying there by this pool that's about to be shaken by the water. But remember who Jesus is. He's able to kind of see on the inside. And then later on, I think it comes um, uh, uh, about also where Jesus makes a, a statement to this guy that kind of shows us kind of where Jesus is coming from. And that is, do you want to be made well? And now the man makes a request of Jesus. And what does he, what does he say? Or at least he... Yes, to help me get into the water. Yeah, help. I, I don't have anybody to help me into the water. So I'd like to be made well, but nobody will, because whenever the water's disturbed, what happens? By the way, you know, and somebody else kind of steps in front. And so we see this, this is kind of what he's letting Jesus know his, his uh, situation. Um, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool whenever the water is stirred up. Well, while I'm coming, another steps down before me. So what does Jesus do? Does he pick him up and put him in the pool? Nope. What does he tell him? Speak. Speaks to him to do what? Pick up your bed and walk. Pick up your bed and walk off. And the man does what? Picks up the pallet and starts walking off. Now, um, in verse 9, we see, uh, or verse 8, Jesus said, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. There's a problem. In verse 9, what's the problem? Sabbath. It's a Sabbath day. Is it really a problem? Not really, but the Jews make it a problem. Well, we're going to make it a problem, right? Yeah. Where there is no problem, we're going to make a problem. And so we see in verse 9, it's, it ends with, now it was a Sabbath on that day. If, um, if you look up, all of these miracles that happen in, um, on the Sabbath, Jesus continues, this isn't the only one, but there's other miracles that continue to happen on the Sabbath. So what's about to happen, what's about to transpire here, Jesus takes no regard towards uh, those Pharisees and what they're about to say about this. So it was a Sabbath. Uh, the Jews were saying this man who was cured, um, they were saying to him, uh, it's the Sabbath. Now here's the, you shouldn't be carrying the pallet that you should be laying in. So it's kind of a very strange thing that they actually say here. Go ahead, Stephen. Part of these Sabbath day miracles, Jesus is purposely provoking Correct. that debate and bringing out their hypocrisy for everyone to see. Yeah, uh, and, there's a, and there's a couple, I'll maybe we'll kind of go through that. Um, in in, in uh, Matthew chapter 12, of course, this was not a miracle, but they were picking the grains and um, it says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 2, 
But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the fair, uh, presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? And so he defends that. And so certainly, if he's defending just plucking grains, he's certainly going to defend um, the healings that are that are going on in some of these uh, miracles that go on also. In um, in, in uh, Luke chapter six is uh, the corresponding to Matthew chapter two, uh, two or twelve in that. Um, uh, let's see. Let's turn to John chapter seven. Uh, let's go and turn to John chapter nine and verse sixteen um, again they are going to start challenging him on this Sabbath, so therefore the accusation is that he's not what? From God. That he's not from God. He can't be because he's breaking God's law of the Sabbath. So in John chapter 9 and verse 16, it says, Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So... Him doing this on the Sabbath is showing a crack in the foundation of the Pharisees and the, the way of thinking of the Sabbath. And uh, again, as you pointed out, um, uh, Stephen, you know, that there is some confrontation about it, and he purposefully starts to do this in order to bring about that division uh, amongst them and to challenge them on their thinking. And he even goes on to say, you know, this is ridiculous. Which one of you who has an ox that falls into the, to the, um, into the ditch wouldn't go out and get him? And so um, we, we're starting to see, you know, again, so far it's kind of been smooth sailing from here. There's been some questions about who this guy is and some of his teachings, but now they're actually going to start attacking him on his teaching or at least what he's doing on the Sabbath here in John chapter 5. And... Um, so backing up, um, we see that um, they start questioning, it's the Sabbath, and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. Of course, we know that you were sick, which is very odd that you would see a lame man carrying a bed, but they're more, they're more concerned about him carrying the bed than they are about how did you get healed. And then he answered and said, but the man who healed me told me to do this. And they said, well... Who is the man that said to you, take up your bed and walk? You know, they got to go kind of question him. We, we need to get to the source of the problem here. And in verse uh, 13, now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. So there's a lot of people around, and he just kind of told the guy, get up your bed and walk, and he does. And then Jesus kind of disappears into the crowd. Afterwards, Jesus sees the guy in verse 14, uh, him and he sees him in the temple so you know uh, this guy is um, going back to the temple and he said to him I, I see that you are well sin no more now why does he make that statement of sin no more there's more to that time all right, go ahead. Bless that worst thing come upon you. Yeah, something even worse can come upon you. And also, you know, I don't know if the, the question that Jesus asked him at the first, if he's asking, do you want to be made well? Because we see that there was a time whenever you had a, a uh, someone who was lame and come down from the ceiling, and he says, your sins are forgiven you. And then everybody's like, who can forgive except God? And he said, well, which is easier, to, to forgive sins or to make the, make the uh, lame man walk again? Just so you know that I have authority, go ahead and pick up your pal and walk. And um, so the question that he asked him, uh, obviously he's asking about the physical thing. You know, are you, do you want to be made well? But now the question really kind of comes into focus, now that you are well, Sin no more. 
So what is Jesus more concerned about? Is he more concerned about his physical health or his spiritual health? He's more concerned about his spiritual health because something worse can happen to you. Do you think he's talking about his legs getting cut off or something like that? Or do you think that he's going to lose his soul if he continues in sin? Is it true? Correct. And again, why were these signs given? <laughs> to prove the words to, to, so that people would believe. Do you think this man's a believer now? Absolutely. Now, he may not have known who Jesus was, but he's finding out more about him now. And um, so he says, um, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. Uh, and this was uh, why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. And again, remember that, because that becomes a point of contention throughout uh, the book and through the other Gospels as well on some of these uh, miracles that he does. But he, Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. So what does that mean? Does God take a break? doesn't even take a break on Sabbath. You know, he's still looking out for his children. And um, we also see something that Jesus is about to, to claim here uh, to them that enrages them even more. Um, it's not so much about the Sabbath now, but that he's about to claim himself equal with God. And... Um, but, you know, I just thought that was interesting when he said that, you know, my father's working, I'm working, we're doing the works that, you know, I'm doing the works that the father sent me to do. So, in verse 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his father, making himself equal with God. So now we've got two accusations against this man who's doing these crazy things and talking this crazy talk. And we see that they had an issue with him whenever he was baptizing more than John. They, you know, they, his popularity was starting to rise when he was baptizing more than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, I have to decrease so he can increase. And now we're starting to see an increase in the popularity of Jesus and we're also starting to see that a lot more people are starting to pay attention to some of these things. Again, this thing happened with this uh, lame man. It says that there was a crowd around. So it wasn't just some private setting or anything like that. There was, there was people around, and so you know this was kind of going around about what had happened. Um, and so we see that now we've got two accusations. If you will, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 5. Now, let's back up just a little bit. Um, we'll start in verse 1. Philippians 2, verse 1 through 6. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. By being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And so we see that, you know, he claims to be equal with God in this statement. Uh, that's how they, they understood it whenever he claimed God was his father. And so did he think that was a thing to be grasped, according to Philippians? Yes. Them to do grasp, yes. Okay. And according to Philippians, he did what? He emptied himself in order to do what? To become a bondservant, to become something, you know, that we can now read about to show us the way to God. Go ahead. You empty your self as in your personal 
I will say desires, that's a lack of a better word right now, but you empty that so that you can replace it with your service. Okay, very good. Um, you know, you, yeah, exactly. You, you are, what you are doing is you're putting yourself aside and your own personal interests aside for the betterment of others. And that's exactly what Jesus did according to Philippians chapter 2. And we see that kind of playing out here also. He came down here. He didn't come down. Do you think he came down here just to heal people? Uh, if that were the case, he would heal everyone. Right. But what we do see is that he came down here to perform these signs and these miracles so that his word that he said would be listened to so that people might find him through the scriptures and then find him uh, find themselves um, with God in eternity. Any questions? Comments? Go ahead. Um, when he says, my father's been working until now and I have been working, the, the Jews understood exactly that he was saying, I'm of the same nature as God. Right. Uh, some brethren in times past, and I guess even today, have used the Philippians passage to say he emptied himself of his deity. There's, but God cannot not be God. Correct. <laughs> and so he's uh, sort of like what Rick was saying, what you've alluded to. He, he left that heavenly abode to come to this earth and live in the flesh, as John 1 talks about. And... Um, and to live among men, to face the, the difficulties, the suffering, the trials of men, and to ultimately offer himself as that sacrifice. And in that way, serving man, being a servant of mankind. And as he's down here fulfilling that duty, he just makes it very plain to people, you need to understand who I am. And when he said that plainly to them, the Jewish leaders at least were enraged. Yes. Um whenever uh and we see this kind of played out also in the book of um in the book of hebrews where he talks about that he became lower than the angels but which one of the angels did he ever say to my son um and so and i'm in hebrews chapter one um in verse five for which to which of the angels did he ever say you are my son today i've begotten you and again i will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me and when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. And uh, he goes on um, quoting the Old Testament there. But um, in verse 13 again, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And we see this, that he's saying this about Jesus. And it says in verse 3, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he inherited a more excellent name than they. So he became lower than the angels. However, as you pointed out, he didn't, it wasn't that he wasn't God. Which of the angels did he ever say these things to? So he's higher than the angels. And um, so, um, you know, I, and if I came across as if I was saying that he was a man only, uh, that's certainly not the, the indication at all. Uh, here in John, what we see is their implication of him saying he was equal with God, and that is correct. He did say that. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, scripture says he took off flesh. Didn't correct. It? Didn't empty out anything. Yeah, he didn't give up. Yeah. Uh, just that Jehovah's Witnesses, if you ever study with them, they'll, they'll try to claim Jesus never claimed to be deity. Right. Well, this is one of many places that it shows, yeah, he did claim, and not that he was a great angel or an archangel, which is their description of him, but he said very plainly, I am the Right, and what we see, uh, their, their reaction actually shows uh, how they took, you know, that, um, what, what he says, and that is, um, they wanted to, uh, in verse, um, Verse 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because of what he just said. 
And so, and he doesn't back down, you know, and say, well, that's not, you know, he doesn't back down from that. But he does say to this to them. So Jesus says to them in verse 19, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. And so, again, equal with. Whatever the father does, that's what the son is doing. And then he goes on to say, For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he uh, show him, so that you may marvel. So again, these works and these signs and these wonders are for them. They're not just so that Jesus, you know, can uh, be proud of what he's capable of doing, but it is for them so that they may believe. And um, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. And there's numerous scriptures uh, that we can look at uh, in this where it talks about Jesus. Uh, well, we know one about Lazarus but that his resurrection is the reason or the difference between all other things that you have going on. And that is in the religious world, in the non-religious world, if Jesus Christ was not resurrected, if he did not raise himself from the dead, then we are men to be most pitied because none of this means anything then. And again, and I want to stress that because as we kind of get into John and as it wraps up and that resurrection starts to happen, he wrote these things so that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he was raised again. It is not enough for us to say that I believe that. It did happen. Whether you believe it or not, it did happen. And we have to make a, a hard stance in that and understand that that is the number one thing that Jesus did for us was that he came again out of out of death and he rose again so that we could be in the likeness of that resurrection and when you look up that word resurrection it continues uh, and understand that that uh, concept and understanding that you have to be able to defend that because in today's religious world, and even specifically in today's secular world, what's the teaching? There's no such thing as exists. And even the religious world says, well, if you believe, that's great. But that's, that's not, it, it still happened. Whether I choose to believe it or not, it's a, it's a fact. And we have to be able to prove that. In today's humanistic world, of teaching evolution and everything else. The only reason we're teaching evolution is because there is no other option. There's either a God or there's not a God. And, um, you know, and if you prove that God created the universe, the plausibility of the resurrection starts to become greater and greater. And so, you know, I ain't going to get in all that. But anyway, let's get back to the text. But understanding that um, what, what he's doing right here is so that they may believe. Um, Therefore, Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, a son can do nothing unless he sees the Father. Um, and in verse 22, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Again, if you're honoring the Father, how should you honor the Son? equally, even as. And he goes on to say, he does not honor the Son, does not honor the Father. So the only way in order to honor the Father is to honor the Son. And we see that they're going to have a real hard time with that. He goes on in verse 24, truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Now, I want to take a moment just to kind of pause, because this is, he continues on uh, this statement um, of, of all these things, and I don't want to get lost in that, but I do want to take a moment just to pause for a second, because 
What he says here in verse 24 and 25 is the exact same st sentence structure as Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Now, what does Mark 16, 16 say? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He who does, who does not believe shall be condemned. All right. So there's two things in order to be saved in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. In John chapter 5 and verse 24, truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Two things in order to have eternal life. Verse 25, truly I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Where's the believing? So if you take the same sentence structure as you do Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 and you apply it to John chapter 5 verses 24 and 25 and he's not even done because there's other things that he says goes on here about eternal life. But just that alone, and that is the ones who are, in, who are dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will now live. So where's the believing now? So... Do we only hear and now? You're, you're, you're giving the same, the same argument that those would try to take away baptism. Correct. Exactly. And what we see in verse 26, For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself, and he gave him authority to execute judgment because he's the Son of Man. Now notice this, verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. So everybody's going to hear him and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. Those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Now we're talking about the exact same people here, and that is the dead. And he says, those who hear will live in the first part. Now we see that we're talking about the same dead, and he says, don't marvel at this. But there will come a time, and as now is, when those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. So what's he talking about here, doing these good deeds? They were equal with what? Starting at verse 24. If you hear and believe. And now we see that the dead hear and those who uh, do the good deeds to a resurrection of life. So what is that belief? It is obedience. It is obedience. It's the good deeds, not just deeds. He goes on to say, those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. And when he says this, he also says in verse 27, he gave him authority to execute this judgment because he is the son of man. Let's continue on. I can do nothing my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There's another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. So now we're talking about being saved only based upon what? What Jesus says. No hearing, no believing. Again, if you take it according to Mark 16, 16 argument. But the fact is this. It takes hearing. It takes believing. It takes obedience. It takes the word of Christ. All of those things play into the salvation of mankind. And we also see that he was sent here to do these things. And he doesn't do anything of his own initiative. He does things according to what God has told him or what the Father uh, tells him. 
We see also, but the testimony, uh, he talks about John's testimony, but the testimony that I have is greater than the testimony of John for the works which the Father has given to me to accomplish, the very works that I do. And what's he talking about? Now remember the situation that we have going on here. Miracles. Miracles. This thing has been performed. Their issue with it is that it's on the Sabbath day, and now he's, create, he's called himself to be God, equal with God. They don't like that either. So they're wanting to kill him, and this is his explanation as to why he's doing what he's doing. And he's doing all of these things so that people will hear him, believe him, obey him, and have eternal life. He goes on, the Father who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice. Now again, they haven't heard. You have not heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him who he sent. So what's this again about the hearing and the word and believing? It all goes hand in hand. And we also see all these things about these good deeds and evil deeds. Where do you think they are? Because he said those who believe or who hurt hear and believe do the good deeds, they are in the resurrection of life. But you won't listen. You're, you don't hear. You're not hearing. They're not doing the very first foundational thing that has to happen, that is a person must hear. <clears throat> so you don't have his word biting in you. And now verse 39, to me, is why John talks about, in John chapter 1, about Jesus was what? He was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Because verse 39 says this, you search the scriptures, because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. So they're searching, and what are they searching for? It looks like they're searching for their idea, mm -hmm. and not what's in front of them. Mm -hmm. Well, it, he gives them credit. I think that you're searching for eternal life, but if you do what? He, he says you're even searching in the scriptures. Yeah, you're doing the right thing. I am those scriptures fulfilled. That's what he says basically here. It's those things that testify of me. Now all these testifying, we talked about John the Baptist testimony, and he says I've got one that's greater than that, and that is my father testifies of me. And then he goes on to. Now he says the word, the scriptures testify of me. So what's he pointing them towards? These things that have been spoken in times past are from the Father. And he goes on to talk to say this in verse um, 40. Uh, let's just start in verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. That very thing that you are looking for, I hold. And now we're about to see here very shortly that he says, there's one less than I that, that judges you. And, um, but what we see is that in verse 40, the very thing they're looking for, he's the fulfillment of all those things, and yet they are completely ignoring him. They are challenging him because he is doing what? He's healing. He's pre, uh, doing all these signs, these wonders, these miracles that his father sent him to do. All of the things that he's doing were spoken of in the scriptures. All the things that he's teaching about. That conversation that he had with Nicodemus. The conversation with the woman at the well. The conversation that he's having with this, with this man, this lame man. All of those things speak to the scriptures. Or they, they are the fulfillment of those scriptures. Go ahead. We see Jesus Christ talking to the religious leaders. However, the Gentiles 
understood and gave homage to it, you know, and recognized it. But their, but their religion is so perverted they can't, they're, they're blotted out, they can't see it. Yeah. And, you know, now this is interesting to me because if you look at what he's challenging them on, it's that you're searching the scriptures, but you're not seeing, you're not hearing the scriptures, because here I am. But yet in John chapter, um, John chapter 4, when he heals the, um, the royal official son, um, what does he say to him? No, he says, if you, you know, if you, if you didn't, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. But yet they have the very thing that would lead them to Christ. And it ain't signs and wonders. It's the scriptures. And that's the very thing that the Samaritans didn't have, was the scriptures. And so they are without excuse. And that's really what he's saying here. Any comment? Go ahead. He, he laid out all those claims about his equality with God in all these different areas, and now he's giving the proof of those claims. You, you know, I'm not just out here spouting this. Look at what the evidence is right in front of you. You've, right. you've had John. You've heard John. Everybody's heard John. You see the miracles that I've done. Even today, you, uh, the scriptures, go and search those scriptures and you'll find me in those scriptures. They're all pointing to me. So all this evidence is staring them in the face and they refuse to believe it. And we should not be shocked when we talk to people and we put our finger on it in the Bible and they look at it and absolutely refuse to believe it. Now, if we, we're, we scratch our heads, we get frustrated. Imagine how he felt on this occasion. Yep. What, what more can I do? <laughs> right. Exactly. Very good. And we can see the danger here of coming at the scriptures to, ver to validate what we believe already. We can't do that because that's what these Jews were doing. They were blinded, as you pointed out, because, the, because Christ wasn't fulfilling what they believed the Messiah should be. They didn't, they didn't want to hear it. It, it talked about, as uh, Stephen mentioned, John the Baptist. Well, their belief burned bright for a while. It didn't really pan out that it was what they wanted, so that fire went out. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't want to hear what John had to say once they figured out that it really wasn't, didn't validate what that what they believed. So we need to be very careful that we don't approach the scriptures in an attempt to validate our own beliefs. We need to open up the scriptures with an honest heart to see what they say as instructions to us. Correct. The scriptures are designed to change us. It's not so that we can change the scriptures to believe or to make it out to what we believe. And that's, that's why, you know, if we try to figure out, well, is evolution kind of true? Is, you know, science and global, you know, if we take the, the ideas of mankind and try to fit them into scriptures, that's a, that's a losing battle. You set that to the side, see what the scriptures have to say, and live your life by that. Forget about the rest. Don't get bogged down with the wisdom of men. That's where, you know, our children lose their souls because they try, we try to fit in the science of man in the scriptures, and that never, ever works. Right. That's always a bad Very good. Anything else? All right, let's move on because he, he isn't done talking, <laughs> and so we're not done studying. Um, he says in verse 41, I do not receive glory from men. In other words, your validation of me is really nothing. I mean, because the testimony that I have comes from God. It comes from the scriptures. It comes from God. And then he says, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. So these great and mighty people that they had kind of coming along, and then he says, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Where do you want your life to be validated from? And where do you want your glory to come from? And we get trapped in that a lot of times because we feel like our purpose and our uh, goal in life is to have a successful name amongst men. 
But that's not really where it goes. I mean, what good does that do if one man gives glory to another man? That's just man's glory. However, what we see is you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. Now, where does Jesus get his glory from? I'm doing what the Father tells me to do. I'm doing what the Scripture said. That's where my testimony, where everything about me is located. Quickly. This is a pattern that Jesus uses throughout his life on earth. We just saw it back in John 4 when he's talking to the woman at the well. He says, I can give you a gift of water that will you know, never allow you to thirst again. He's pointing to these people now. I, he's pointing to them to the source. He says, I'm the source, and the Father's the source, and you're still rejecting it. Correct. Come back to the source. Right. And that's, that's, this is a repetition. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life later on. He's still saying, I'm the source. I'm the source of what you need, and it's constant rejection. Correct. And so whenever we get down to judgment, who does the judging here? Because it says um, in, um, in verse, uh, where was I? Oh, verse 27, and he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Now, notice what he says here in verse 43. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope upon. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So, in other words, judgment has already began. And they are judging themselves unworthy. They judge themselves um, in dis because they disbelieve. And it's the very thing that they continue to look into that can save them, that will not save them, because they refuse to believe what it says. Go ahead. A little side note here. When he says believe Moses, Moses is Genesis to Deuteronomy, the creation account, the flood, right. the tower, all those things in the first few chapters of Genesis that John referenced a while ago that even brethren want to compromise on. And people talk about, well, you know, whether you believe in theistic evolution or not and all those things back there, it's not a matter of salvation. Jesus says, yeah, it absolutely is. If, if you believe error about the creation account, you believe error about the flood, you're, you're not going to have true belief when you come into the New Testament. It just it can't happen. You, you rip out the foundation and the rest of it's going to fall. Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, I often say, Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If you don't have an issue with that, everything else is going to flow right real easy for you. But if you do have an issue with that, you're going to have a bumpy ride through the, through the scriptures. And, you know, because it's the foundation of, of where everything kind of starts. What we see here, again, I'm glad you pointed out because... Moses didn't write the whole of the Old Testament. Mo what Moses wrote was the law and those things found in it and the creation account and all those uh, stories that you, that you uh, had mentioned. And so what we see here is that Jesus is found inside of those things. If they were to believe what Moses wrote, they would believe what he wrote or what he said. But what do we see? If you believe Moses, you believe me. And if you believe me, you believe the Father. There's a connection between all of those um, scriptures that they've been searching for that they think they believe, but they don't. And they are very much um, have been lied to themselves. But well, it's, it's kind of like the, what you see in today's religious world. You see so many of of the people out there that want to take their scriptures and make it the way they want it. And the hierarchy of the Pharisees and such, they had a habit of trying to turn 
the scriptures into something <clears throat> that wasn't really there. You know, right. they wanted to make it their way. Right. Not, you know. Well, um, and I, let me say this because uh, we got to wrap things up. It's we're out of time. But let me say this: what Jesus is saying here is that you do not need these signs, miracles, and wonders. He gave them to them so that they would listen to him. But those things are not necessary for one to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, in today's religious world, what we are taught is if you have this feeling come upon you, you have to have some of those things before you can know what God wants of your life. You have to have miracles. You have to be able to see miracles today. A lot of people will say, you know, if miracles don't exist, you must, you must have a pretty weak faith if you don't believe in miracles. Well, what I'm reading here, and what I read in John chapter, uh, in the, John chapter 20 is this, that those things were written down so that I may believe. I don't have to see them. But you're saying you have to see those things. Who has the weaker faith? The person who reads the scriptures and the testimony that comes out of the scriptures that Jesus was talking about here? Or is it the person that has to see all these miracle signs and wonders and all of that? Who has the greater faith? We read it. We believe it. And John lays all of this out for us so that we may come to, come, come to know Christ and know him better so that we can have eternal life. And believing in his name have eternal life. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Is you have Moses and we even hear him whenever uh, we uh, hear the story of the, um, the rich man and Lazarus. <coughs> they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. No, but if one comes back from the dead, if one comes back from the dead, they still will not listen. They have Moses and the prophets. So Jesus, in all of his teaching, continues to point back to, go to the scriptures, you'll find me there. Anything else? Mike, it's worth pointing out that those Jews sought the glory of men over the glory of God, and Christ tells them, I didn't come here to get the glory for men. He's not there to win the popularity contest. He's there to glorify God. That's what the Jews rejected. They wanted, they wanted the approval and the glory from their fellow mankind, and that's why they would not buy in. What he, was, what he was teaching. Yeah. You're a good Jew. I mean, you tithe mint and cumin. All right. Anything else? If not, we'll go ahead and release class. Thank you.